Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, professor. How's everybody doing today? Everybody ready to get done with this and go out and get in the sun? So we'll make this as long and tedious as we possibly can. No. All right. Um, let's see. We're starting on what I may hear some cheers about, the last metabolism topic of, the, uh, of, of biochemistry. So you'll be happy for that. Uh, we save the best and the most complicated for last. So um, it actually is fairly complicated, but I, I do um, sort of organize it so that it's not, uh, we, we, we miss a lot of the tedium of it. Uh, one of the things um, I want you to take away from what I'm going to be talking about um, both today and on Monday um, is not so much the complexity of the, um, uh, not so much the complexity of nucleotide metabolism but really the elaborateness of the controls and the reasons for them. And I'll tell you right off the bat what the reasons for them are. We're going to see that cells go to great lengths to balance the relative numbers of nucleotides they have in them. They go to great lengths to do that. And the reason that they do that is because if those things get out of balance, they will mutate. Okay? And so mutation is not something that cells want to favor and cells therefore place probably as much control on this, these metabolic pathways that we'll be talking about as any metabolic pathways that they have. Okay? Now the good news is that you won't see hormonal regulation. Okay? So that won't uh, factor into this. Jenny, do you have a question? So when you say mutate, you mean the individual nucleotides mutate or that they just get put in the wrong place? Okay, so the question is, do I see the individual mutate, nucleotides mutate? No, an individual nu nucleotide can't mutate. So mutation happens when they get inserted improperly into the DNA. So that's what a mutation is all about. So mutation is happening when the wrong nucleotide is placed uh, across from a base in, in, our, in, a, in, a, in making a DNA. So if I put an A across from a G, for example, that's a mutation. Okay? All right. I hear what? <laughs> DNA, what's that, right? Okay. So uh, that's where we start. Now, I'm going to start uh, fairly basic, uh, talking uh, not about salvage versus de novo. Uh, that's kind of a dumb figure. I want to say a little bit about nomenclature, and I know that some of you think you know this, and I will think probably many of you won't know this. So, you know, of course, that RNA contains four uh, nucleotides that contain four different bases. Okay? They contain adenine, guanine, uracil, cytosine, A, G, U, C. In DNA, uracil is replaced by thymine, and of course, I think every grade school kid today knows that. All right? Grade school, they're starting, you'd be, you'd be surprised. I shouldn't say every, but uh, I actually know grade school kids who do know this. It's, it's phenomenal. All right. Now, what we see um, is on this screen, I think a good depiction of three different levels of nucleotides. Okay? Well, not three different levels because they're not all nucleotides. Only the ones on the right are nucleotides. So when we talk about nucleotide, we're kind of careless in throwing that term out, as I just was myself. A nucleotide is something that has three components. It has a base, it has a sugar, and it has at least one phosphate. A base, a sugar, and at least one phosphate. ATP is a nucleotide because it has a base, it has a sugar, and in this case it has three phosphates. Okay? Now, when people see bases, they usually think nucleotide, and that's not right. Adenine is not a nucleotide. Adenine is a base. Adenine pairs with thymine. Okay? If we take a base and we connect it to a sugar, we create something called a nucleoside. So a nucleoside is a base plus a sugar. Or if you want to think about it, it is a nucleotide minus its phosphates. Okay? Now, the names change. Adenine becomes adenosine. So when we talk about the, the ribo, and notice now we've got ribonucleosides and we've got deoxyribonucleosides. That tells us there's different sugars on there. 
ribonucleosides have the sugar ribose attached to the base. So if I put ribose on adenine, I make adenosine. If I put ribose on guanine, I make guanosine. If I put ribose on uracil, I make uridine. If I put ribose on cytosine, I make cytidine. Okay. If I put deoxyribose on adenine, blah, 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 you get the idea. Now, your book uses the older nomenclature where they don't put the deoxy. And the reason they don't put deoxy there is it's implied. They used to feel that you don't have deox you don't have ribose on, thy on th uh, thymine. But it turns out in RNA, you actually do. Some RNAs have what are called ribothymine, ri ribothymidines. So I like to use the de designation deoxythymidine. Okay, so all of them are deoxys. Deoxythymidine, deoxycytidine, deoxyguanosine, deoxyadenosine. And we'll see later there actually is a deoxyuridine. Okay? That's not for right now. All right, so there are the, the ribonucleosides. The ribonucleotides, we put at least one phosphate on there. Now, I'm not real fond of these names. You can use them if you want to, all right? More commonly, let me tell you what you will hear them named as, and students find it confusing, and it shouldn't be. More commonly, instead of calling it adenylate, although you will hear that sometimes, you'll hear it called adenosine monophosphate. Now, when you hear adenosine, you're thinking, oh, wait, that's a ribonucleoside. Yes, adenosine refers to the ribonucleoside, and you put a phosphate on a, a ribonucleoside, you get a phosphate, a, a phosphate, a nucleotide. You put a phosphate on, you get a phosphate, right? I want to go outside too, all right? So, all of these guys can be named adenosine monophosphate, adenosine diphosphate, or adenosine triphosphate. That's why you heard it described as adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Guanosine monophosphate, guanosine diphosphate, guanosine tri triphosphate, all right? Uridine monophosphate, uridine diphosphate, etc. Okay, so are we all clear on that? So nucleotides have a phosphate. Nucleosides lack that phosphate. And bases are simply a base. Okay, so don't confuse those terms. Those are important, and, and I can guarantee you'll see them again. All right, now we talked about the sugars. Here are the sugars. Ribose, last term, you had to memorize. One of the sugars I made you memorize the structure of was ribose. And I said, trust me, I don't make you memorize things unless they're important. And the importance here is that this guy is a critical component of nucleosides and nucleotides, specifically ribonucleotides. Okay? In general, when I use the term nucleotide, I'll be referring to all nucleotides. That includes ribonucleotides, deoxyribonucleotides. Okay? If I'm being specific, I'll say ribonucleotides, deoxyribonucleotides. But if I'm talking just nucleotide, then I'm talking about the whole collection of all of them. Ribose is found in the ribonucleotides. Okay? It's a simple structure, five carbons. Both of the hydroxyls on positions two and three are down. The uh, in the case of ad when we attach uh, a base to it, the base gets attached over here on the hydroxyl on carbon number one. And yes, the hydroxyl in a nucleotide and a nucleoside is in the beta configuration. Okay? All right, that's deoxyribose. I'm sorry, that's, that, that's well, my name, mine is not working. That is ribose. This is deoxyribose. Deoxyribose, by contrast, as its name implies, is lacking in oxygen. And specifically, the oxygen that it's lacking is the oxygen at position number two. Some people call it 2-deoxyribose. Now, as we shall see, we almost never in the cell see free deoxyribose. So it's not made as deoxyribose. We'll see that it arises from alteration of nucleotides. Okay? It arises as a result of, ox of, of, of um, um, the reaction of nucleotides. And I'll show you that not today, but actually on Monday. 
Okay? So deoxyribose is what gives DNA, the D part of its name, deoxyribonucleic acid. These guys contain uh, the sugar deoxyribose. Now, that small change, removing that oxygen right there, has a big change on the properties of RNA and DNA. RNA has the hydroxyl. It turns out that RNA, because that hydroxyl is there, is very, very susceptible to being cleaved by um, basic solutions. You add NEOH, you will damage, destroy RNA because the bond between these carbons with these two hydroxyls will, will, will be readily broken in the presence of a base. That's not the case with DNA. Okay? So this right here gives this stability in the, for, in the presence of a base. Another thing is that the lack of this oxygen allows DNA to form double helices that can exist in several different forms. They can exist in the A form. They can exist in the B form. They can exist in the Z form. All three of these, these different structures are possible in a double helix of DNA. In a double helix of RNA, only the A form can form. Okay? So we don't see that flexibility in RNA. And again, because you might imagine that oxygen is a little bit bulky and it gives less freedom to move things around. That's exactly what happens in RNA. Okay, the basis. No, you're not going to have to memorize the structures. But you should know about them, what categories they fit into. So U, uracil, C, cytosine, and, and, and T, thymine. And by the way, thymine, T-H-Y-M-I-N-E, is not thiamine, the vitamin, T-H-I-A-M-I-N-E. I frequently see those two mixed up, and they are definitely not the same. So when you're talking about the base, you're talking about T-H-Y-M-I-N-E. These three bases are what we refer to as pyrimidines. P-Y-R-I-M-I-D-I-N-E-S. Pyrimidines have a single ring. They're simpler than A and G, which are known as purines. So pyrimidines are relatively simple, and that's how they look. It's actually through this bond right here that the attachment is made to the ribose or deoxyribose as appropriate. Okay, there is uracil, there is cytosine. And if you look very carefully, you'll see thymine looks a bit like it. Okay, one difference being this methyl group and another difference being right here. Uh, and I'll say some things about those later uh, with respect to mutation. Okay. The purines are adenine and guanine, and adenine and guanine, you see, have a double ring. They're bigger, they're bulkier. Now, you know, of course, that A pairs with T, or A pairs with U if we're talking about RNA and DNA, and C pairs with G. That means that whenever we make a double helix, whether it's RNA or DNA, what we have in that double helix is one side we have pyrimidine, and the other side we have purine. Now that's important because it means that the width, the diameter of the, uh, of the uh, double helix doesn't change as a function of what is in it. It doesn't change. Big, little, big, little, big, little. We have different sequence, but the width is basically the same as long as we have all of those. Now, um, as you probably know, G and C uh, are held together in the internal portion of DNA by hydrogen bonds. And between G and C, there are three hydrogen bonds. Between A and T, there are two hydrogen bonds. And between A and U, there are two hydrogen bonds. So GCs have the most hydrogen bonds holding them together, and therefore have the greatest strength holding them together, and are the hardest to pull apart. And we'll see um, in about uh, two weeks why that's a very, very important consideration. Okay, 
Here's the ribonucleotides, UTP, uridine triphosphate. There's your ribose, there's your base, and there's your triphosphate. Notice that the triphosphate, or any of the phosphates, if you have one, two, or three, are located on carbon number five of the ribose, or deoxyribose, as the case may be. Blah, 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 blah. ATP, CTP, and GTP. OK, and you see similar things here. I'm not going to go through all of them there. You, you guys can flick, flick through them and see for yourselves. All right, now, um, let's talk about how these guys are made. Because how these guys are made, as I said, is kind of complex. We're not going to go through the complexity of it, so I, I will spare you the individual reactions. The reactions leading to uh, pyrimidines and leading to purines each have about 10 steps. And what I want to do in showing you these pathways is talk about the considerations of them and one or two things in them, but I'm not going to make you memorize. There's no enzymes, with, with, except the regulation enzymes, there's no enzymes to memorize and there's no structures to memorize. Okay? All right. So let's turn our attention to pyrimidine biosynthesis. Okay. This is kind of a dumb uh, schematic, but what it's showing us, it's trying to show us anyway, is that we make pyrimidines from very, very, very simple components. When we make a pyrimidine, we make the ring first. Okay, so we're making the top part, we're making that base first, and then after we've made the pyrimidine base, we attach it to a ribose. And the ribose comes in the form of something called PRPP, and I'll say a word about that in just a bit. Okay? So the, in the case of pyrimidines, the base is made first, and then the sugar is attached to it. Purines is backwards from that. Okay? They build the base on the sugar. Build the base on the sugar. All right. Well, what we see as we go through this scheme is that the first nucleotide that we make in what's called the de novo scheme, and I'll explain that in a second, is the, is the, um, is the nucleotide UMP, uridine monophosphate. That's the first one that's made in this pathway. Then UMP is converted to UDP by putting a phosphate onto it, and I'll show you this later. Then into UTP by putting another phosphate onto it, and then UTP is converted into CTP. Okay? So we see sort of a chain leading to these. All right? We will also see that U, and this is a little misleading, it's not from UTP, but instead UDP gives rise to, uh, ultimately, to T, ultimately gives rise to TTP, which is, D, and I, by the way, when you see the D that refers to deoxy, and your book doesn't put that D out there, but I do. So just like they don't talk about deoxythymidine, I talk about deoxythymidine. I also use DTTP to refer to the thymidine uh, triphosphate. Okay? All right, so that's a scheme. Now, let's look at the individual reaction just so you'll be happy to see what all you don't have to memorize. Okay? Actually, I want to say a word about this one. But you're not going to memorize the structure. Don't worry about any of that. Okay. Now, this uh, figure shows us uh, the synthesis of carbamic acid. Okay. And uh, the synthesis of carbamic acid is uh, an important uh, uh, reaction. We notice we're starting with a very simple thing: bicarbonate, and it's getting a phosphate to make carboxyphosphate. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, carboxyphosphate. Then it's getting an amine to make this carbamic acid. Okay? This guy right here is very, very unstable in water. Now, last term, I talked about an enzyme, the enzyme I, that, that, that had an intermediate that was very unstable. And that enzyme was um, um, triose phosphate isomerase. And the way that it overcame that instability was by speeding the reaction up so fast that there was very little time for that unstable intermediate to accumulate and fall apart. Everybody remember that? Let's see some nods, yeah, okay. That was in glycolysis. 
And I said there were other strategies that cells had for keeping um, unstable molecules stable. All right? I'm going to show you one of them. And one of, this one is very cool. And let me show you what this enzyme, and this, this is all part of uh, reactions occurring in, an, in one enzyme. Let me show you what's happening inside of this enzyme. Oh, that's not it, sorry. What's happening is things are going in one end and traveling through the enzyme in a tunnel. So the enzyme literally has a tunnel through which these reactions are occurring. And guess what? In this tunnel, there's no water. So by having an entry point and a passage through, okay, what's happening is there's uh, stability for that unstable molecule. So in this case, we actually have protection from water. Okay? Have protection from water. Now, um, at the very end of last term, I talked about yet another mechanism for protecting an unstable intermediate. Does anybody remember what it was? No? Oh, actually, that, that was too. Uh, the oxyanion hole. That was another, you're right, Mike, that was another one. Uh, but this was actually a physical thing that the enzyme does. The what? The loop. Well, the, the lid. Okay. So we had the enzyme that had the lid. The nucleoside monophosphates had the lid. Remember when we tried to move a phosphate from one side to the other, we wanted to make sure it got there and water didn't go carrying it off somewhere? So the lid was providing that protection. So we're seeing at the um, level of structure, we're seeing how cells have solved problems to make the things that they need. So this enzyme uh, structure is very important, or is, is very interesting. And the enzyme name, uh, I think, probably is worth, is worth knowing. So it's called carbamyl phosphate synthetase. Yeah, I know, it's a long name. Carbamyl phosphate synthetase. It's a novel way of solving that problem. Now, that's starting everything off, OK? All right, so. Here's a bunch of reactions, and we're not going to worry about the reactions, but we're going to worry about one thing on this screen for our purposes. And the one thing we're going to worry about on the screen is actually right here. Right here. All right? We're not going to worry about structure. We're not even going to worry about components. But I want you to, again, keep in mind we're using very simple building blocks. So far we've used phosphate, we've used carbon, uh, bicarbonate, and we've used an amine. Now we're going to add an amino acid. Very, very simple building blocks. And we talk about the reactions on the primordial earth that gave rise to what we now know as nucleotides into DNA, all we had to have were very, very, very simple building blocks. Okay? Now, why do I want you to know this reaction? Well, because you've seen this reaction before and you probably don't realize it. Anybody know what the reaction is I'm talking about? You saw it last term. You didn't have to memorize it then either, so that's probably why you don't know it. Okay? The, in, the reaction that you saw last term was catalyzed by an enzyme called ATCase. Aspartate transcarbamylase, and that actually is where this carbamyl part comes from. Aspartate, there's the aspartic acid, transcarbamylase. Now, what was the significance of that enzyme last term? I hope you remember that. Why did we talk about it? What did you say? Feedback inhibition. Very good, Megan. Okay. So if you recall last term, this enzyme was, was regulated in several ways, and one of which was feedback inhibition. Remember, if we increase the amount of aspartate, we had an allosteric effect. That made the enzyme go faster. If we had the end product of the pathway, it inhibited the enzyme. And what was the end product of the pathway? CTP. And if we had a different nucleotide, it activated the enzyme, and that was ATP. All right. Now, this is the first enzyme now where we're starting to see the cell is balancing things. I talked about this a little bit last term, and I'll mention it here again. All right. If the cell has too much CTP, CTP is the end product of the pathway. If it has too much CTP, you know it's got too much UTP, and it's time to stop making pyrimidines. 
So turning that off makes a lot of sense. If cells have lots of aspartate, that means they've got plenty of amino acids. They have the ability to go ahead and multiply. So you might as well jumpstart pyrimidine biosynthesis. If cells have at this allosteric binding site more ATP than CTP, if ATP wins the race and binds to the ATCase, it turns the enzyme on. And that makes sense because ATP is a purine. And this pathway makes pyrimidines. So if we have more purines than pyrimidines, we're going to stimulate the synthesis of pyrimidines. And if we have more pyrimidines than purines, we're going to turn off pyrimidines. Now, this is the first of what you'll see as several what I describe as balancing reactions. This enzyme helps to balance the relative amounts of pyrimidines versus purines. Very, very important thing. The relative amounts of purines versus pyrimidines. More purines favors the production of pyrimidines. More pyrimidines favors turning off the synthesis of pyrimidines. OK, so ATCase is a very, very important regulatory enzyme in that respect. OK. This enzyme here, which I'm not going to expect you to know, but I'll just mention it as a point of trivia. The enzyme that catalyzes the formation um, of actually, let's see, it's, I'm, no, I'm sorry, not this reaction, it's this reaction. The one that catalyzes this reaction, you've actually also heard of, but I didn't, you don't know because I didn't ask you to memorize it. Last term, this was the enzyme I pointed out that its rate was sped up by a factor of 17 quintillion. We compared what happened. It took how many millions of years for the reaction to occur, half of a reaction to occur. And we used an enzyme that happened in minutes. This is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction right here. OK, for what it's worth. All right. So what you see here is we're starting with simple things. We're getting further along, and we're making rings. OK? We're getting close to making, OK? We're getting close to making UMP. Here's the ring. Here is the sugar now coming in. The sugar comes in before we actually have UMP. And technically, this guy here is a nucleotide, although we don't see it in um, DNA or RNA. Okay. The important thing that's happening here is we're bringing in a sugar. And the sugar we're bringing in is ribose. And look at the structure of the ribose. It's called, it's called Phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. So here, orienting you, this is carbon number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? Notice that we have this guy in the alpha position. And in the reaction, it ends up being, I'm sorry, we have it in, yeah, it ends up being in the beta position. Okay? So the position is flipping. What we're doing is we're clipping off two phosphates. We're clipping off a pyrophosphate. This guy will go out and be degraded. And that helps to pull the reaction. You remember that from last term? OK? So this guy's going to be degraded. And now we have this or orotidylate, which I don't even bother with mentioning because I, I find that I have a hard time even saying the name, orotidylate. OK. This guy, orotidylate, is going to become UMP. Oh, and by the way, notice what we we're left with when we have this is we're left with one phosphate. Okay? That's why I don't like these names, because they don't say anything about how many phosphates are there. But if I said this was uh, orotidate di monophosphate, you would know how many phosphates it has. Okay? So I don't like just the term orotidylate, because it doesn't tell us much about what's out there. We've got mo one phosphate on here. And this one phosphate is now converted into what they call uridylate, what I call uridine monophosphate, or UMP. So congratulations. You've just made your first pyrimidine nucleotide. And you didn't do anything except sit there with a pen and do it, right? Pretty cool. You guys are really quiet today. Do we need a joke? Yes. OK, we need a joke. <clears throat> Let's finish this, and then we'll have a joke. That'll give you, you'll have something to look forward to. OK, so we've got UMP. 
UMP, right? All right. The rest of the pyrimidines are very simple. Getting to, UM, getting to UMP means that we're now ready to put a phosphate onto there. We put a phosphate onto there from ATP, and the enzyme that does that is, is called um, nucleoside monophosphate kinase, is what, I, is what I put down. There's one specific for each UMP. So we could have UMP kinase would put a phosphate onto UMP. We could have AMP kinase that would put a phosphate onto AMP. Okay? Make sense? These are the guys that had the lids. These guys had the lids. Notice the energy in the phosphate comes from ATP and gives us a diphosphate and a diphosphate. Okay? What if I started with AMP and ATP? What would I end up with? Two ADPs, right? Well, that isn't important. What's important is what if I start with two ADPs and I'm running out of energy? I can go that way and make an ATP, right? And notice when I have low energy, AMP is going to accumulate. Make sense? That's why we see AMP accumulating. Because the AMP kinase can make ATP from two ADPs. Now you know how that happens. Okay. Well, we got to the diphosphate. What about the triphosphate, Kevin? Well, the triphosphate, notice I have an X here. That means it can be an A, it can be a C, it can be a G, it can be a U, it can be a T. Any of those will fit there. Same thing here. This can be an A, a C, a G, a T, a U. And what we end up with is, and that's wrong, I wrote that wrong, it should be a D and a D. No, you don't generate it. This becomes a T and this becomes a D. So this, this should be the D over here, sorry. That's a D. I'll change that. All right? So what we've done is we've swapped the phosphates between them. Now, this, these reactions are all catalyzed by the same enzyme. Very simple thing. And yes, this category of enzyme you should know, this category of enzyme you should know. This enzyme is called nucleoside diphosphate kinase, or as I'll refer to it in the future, NDPK. So if I want to convert ADP into ATP, I need NDPK. And if I want to convert CDP into CTP, I need NTPK. And if I want to convert DTDP into DTTP, I need NDPK. You get the idea. All of those will, will rely on NDPK. Well, following what we've been doing so far, we're making UTP. Okay? Because they said we're going to be making the, the primitive nucleotides. We need to make UTP. So in our imaginary scenario right now, we're making UTP. Once we get to UTP, it can be converted into CTP. Okay? This is known as cytidine synthase. Or you can call it CTP synthase if you want. CTP synthase. And all it's doing is it is uh, converting this oxygen to an amine. Okay? That's all that's happening in this reaction, converting an oxygen into an amine. So the relationship between UTP and CTP, they only differ by oxygen versus amine. Now, not surprisingly, that changes the hydrogen bonding properties of these guys. Okay? This versus this, hydrogen bonds differently. Okay, I promised a joke, I'll give you a joke. All right, any questions before I give you the joke? Yeah, back there. Yeah, it's a good question. Do the NDPKs have lids on them? I don't know if they do or not. You would predict they probably might because, again, this phosphate needs to be con constrained. But there's many strategies for getting these things together. We've seen the tunneling and so forth, and I just don't know in the case of NDPK. NDPK is a very interesting enzyme, though, because it uses all different kinds of substrates to accomplish uh, what it does. And it's pretty flexible back and forth. Yes? So you're saying if you're really low on uridine, is that yeah. going to make it really hard then to make... 
Yeah, so a, a very good question, actually. If you're really low on uridine, it's going to be hard to make any of the nucleic acids because so far you've seen that U is necessary for making C and U is also necessary for making T. And it's no surprise that U, of course, is one of the first ones that's made there, and absolutely. So that's, again, why this balance thing is important. When we see that the purines are starting to get a little bit high, you want to really balance it out and get that UTP synthesis going because you're going to run into trouble otherwise. Absolutely. You guys know about the crunch bird? Anybody know about the crunch bird? Okay, the crunch bird. All right. So this lady is, is looking for a present for her husband. Okay? And she wants to get him something different. So she gets scratching her head, you know, and what am I going to get? Oh, what am I going to get my husband? So she goes down to the pet store, okay? And she walks in and she tells the, the lady in the pet, or the, the guy, lady, guy, doesn't matter, the person in the pet store, okay? I need to get a very interesting present for my husband. Lady in the pet store says, oh, piece of cake. Brings out a boa constrictor, okay? She says, well, uh, I don't really want to kill him, you know? So the lady takes it back away. A little bit later, the lady comes, the, the pet ownership owner comes out, and she's got an iguana on a leash. That's really different. Uh, I just don't see it. I don't think so. I want something that's really different. The pet owner says, okay, I think you need a crunch bird. And uh, she says, crunch bird? What's a crunch bird? She says, you see that little bird over there on that perch? Yeah, that's a crunch bird. The lady kind of, you know, what the hell? She says, watch this. And then the pet shop owner says, watch this. Crunch bird, chair. The bird jumps up off of the perch, goes over this wooden chair, sits on it, and demolishes the chair in front of her eyes. Okay? Little tiny bird. Then know what the heck's going on? What's, what's going on with this, with this bird? Pet shop owner says, that's nothing. Crunch bird, desk. And there's this great big wooden desk, okay? The bird flies over there, and in less than a minute, it is sawdust in front of her eyes. The lady says, I gotta have this. <laughs> gotta have this. She takes the bird home to her husband, and she walks in, you know, and she's got the bird on her hand. The husband's sitting there kind of gruff, and he's reading the newspaper. And she says, Honey, I bought you a present for your birthday. What is it? You see this here? Yeah. Well, this is a crutch bird. Crunch burn my butt. <laughs> okay. I hope everybody got that one. You see that he demolishes. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about purine biosynthesis. Now, we've gone through, we talked about pyrimidines, and I've already told you that in pyrimidines, the ring is made first, and then the sugar is attached. In purines, it's backwards. So if you remember when we, when we came in with the sugar in uh, making the purine, the sugar didn't come in as just ribose. It came in as PRPP. PRPP acts as a starting point for the synthesis of the purines. Now I'm going to come back and talk about this salvage pathway probably on Monday. I'm not going to talk about that today. And by the way, when we talk about nucleotide metabolism, we see these terms, salvage and de novo. And I want to explain them before I go any further. Okay? So de novo means starting from new. So when we're making uh, things in a de novo pathway, we're starting with, from scratch. You're not going and getting a Pillsbury mix to make your cake. You're mixing it all together. You're grinding the wheat yourself and doing the whole thing, right? Okay? So when we're making pyrimidines or we're making purines de novo, we're starting with the simple components. We're starting with, with uh, carbon dioxide. We're starting with ammonia. We're starting with amino acids and doing our thing. We'll see it's a little bit more complicated for the purines. But they're very simple things to start with. When we, st when we, when we make nucleotides by salvage, it's like going to the junkyard and getting pieces of an already made car to put onto your car. So salvage synthesis uses components of things that have already been made. So cells can, for example, take in 
DNAs or RNAs from other places and break them down and use those nucleotides for something. So they're salvaging what's there instead of starting from scratch. Does that make sense? So the salvage pathways turn out to be very, very important for human health, and I'll talk about them not today, but on Monday. Okay, so I'm going to focus on de novo synthesis of the purines, and what you saw with the pyrimidines was, of course, de novo synthesis as well. Here's a schematic that shows you in a purine where all the different carbons and nitrogens come from. No, you don't have to memorize this. I just show it to you to again, show the simplicity. The amine comes from aspartate. So aspartic acid is very involved in the making of nucleotides. Here's a carbon from carbon dioxide. The central part of it comes from the simplest amino acid of all, glycine. Here's a carbon that comes from this mouthful of a molecule that, as we will see, is very important. That is a one carbon donor. We'll talk about this uh, later. Here's an, a nitrogen from glutamine. Here's another nitrogen from glutamine, and here's another carbon from this carbon donor. That's how we put those things together to make a purine. We build this onto a PRPP. Now I'll show you the, I'll show you the schematic in a second. But once we've built this structure, we create the first purine nucleotide, which is called IMP, and we'll see that's a branch point in the synthesis of the other uh, of the purine nucleotides we know of as the ones that appear in RNA and DNA. Okay. Now, uh, let's see, where am I? All right, here again, we're not going to focus on the, on the individual reactions, but we are going to focus on, again, the regulation, because the regulation now is going to tell us something about balance. Everybody with me? Okay. Unfortunately, um, I thought I had a figure that showed the PRPP, but I don't. So the very first reaction, which actually precedes this one, there's a reaction in which PRPP has that pyrophosphate part replaced by an amine. So the very first reaction, the synthesis of purines, has PRPP, the pyrophosphate is replaced by an amine. That creates something that doesn't even show the structure of phosphoribosylamine right here. Now, that reaction turns out to be, the one they've ignored and haven't even put on the figure, turns out to be the regulated reaction. It's a very important reaction. Is there a later? Okay. Is there? Oh, maybe I skipped it. Oh, sorry. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Where was that? Oh, I... Yeah, I must have omitted when I put this on here. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. It's, but you, you, you can see it, I can't see it. Now, uh, PRP, so the enzyme that catalyzes the formation of this molecule is a regulated enzyme for, pyrimidine, uh, for purine biosynthesis. The name of the enzyme is called PRPP amidotransferase. And yes, you should know the name of that enzyme. And the reason you should know the name is because it is a regulated enzyme. And its regulation is interesting uh, but important. OK, um, amidotransferase, A-M-I-D-O-T-R-A-N-S-F-E-R-A-S-E. Amidotransferase, so it's PRPP amidotransferase is the full name. Now, this enzyme is, has two levels of regulation. We haven't seen this before two levels of regulation. It is fully inhibited by AMP and GMP. Fully inhibited by both of them. When only one is present, the enzyme is partly inhibited, meaning it's partly active. Now we'll see later why that's important. But I want you to plant that in the back of your head. So it's fully inhibited when they're both present, but when one is, only one is present, it's only partly inhibited. Okay, everybody got that? So it's, it's a different kind of feedback inhibition. That's what's giving rise to this guy right here. Well, this guy right here, we can see, and I just want you to look at this and see the involvement of things. Look at the energy that's going into making the nucleotides. ATP, 
ATP. Here's a carbon coming in from this um, uh, big mouthful molecule I described earlier. Here's ATP. Here's ATP. Okay. So making nucleotides is a very intensive, energy intensive process. So it's another reason cells want to control how much they make. They don't want to waste energy if they don't need to make it. And by the way, I should point out that what this enzyme does is it helps to regulate the relative amounts of A and G. And we'll see how that occurs later. So PRPP amidotransferase helps to regulate how much A and G. There's balancing A's and G's. Okay. Well, this guy is getting uh, more complicated. And by the way, they're not showing you the ribose. In each case, they're just writing the ribose out here. So you have to picture that yourself in these syntheses. But it's been present in every, every one of the molecules so far. OK. Now, we go through those reactions, and we get to something called inosinate, which is just another nucleotide that you haven't heard of before. We don't worry too much about it, other than the point, and, and, and it was also called IMP. And no, inosine monophosphate. So I, I think you should know that inosine monophosphate, IMP, is a branch in the synthesis of either AMP or GMP. It's the branch point. Now, I'd like you to look and see what happens here. As we go from IMP in the top path, we go here, we uh, bring in an aspartic acid, we bring in some energy. And we kick out a fumarate. Okay? We end up with AMP. Notice the source of the energy. It's GTP. GTP is the source of energy for making AMP. And we go down the bottom pathway, we see that ATP is the energy for making GMP. This is pretty good balance. If we were relying on GTP to make GMP, what if we don't have any GTP? Well, the reason we're making GMP is because we need some. Right? So having this as a balance is very important. Now, let's imagine also that I am making GMP because I don't have any. But I've got plenty of ATP. I've got plenty of AMP. OK? What's going to happen if I fully shut off that first enzyme? I'm never going to be able to make GMP. The cell would not be able to do anything. The cell would die. So having this regulation where the enzyme is partly active allows those first reactions to occur, and it gets all the way up here to IMP, and then something cool. This enzyme, whose name I'm not even going to give you, is inhibited by AMP. And this enzyme is inhibited by GMP. Now, the result of all these things is that we have a balance achieved between the relative amounts of AMP and GMP. OK? Make sense? So we've balanced purines and pyrimidines with ATCase. We've balanced AMP and GMP with PRPP and mitotransferase. What's missing from the equation? Or is it too late on Friday to think about that? U and C, right? OK. We've got to balance U and C. I haven't told you how we do that. All right. And I should have, but I just realized that. OK. The enzyme CTP synthase that made that U into C is inhibited by C. CTP synthase that makes UTP into CTP is inhibited by CTP. That gives balance between U and C. So now we balance purines, pyrimidines, A and G, and U and C. Pretty cool. We haven't talked about the deoxyribonucleotides. We will talk about those next time. That gives a very good stopping point right now. Uh, we'll see if their balancing is even more interesting on Monday.
Dara, how you doing? I had a question, just the, the regrades, we submitted a regrade uh -huh. a couple days ago. Yep. Um, I don't know if you repicked those up or not, and then I wanted to say, so with today's knowledge, my bad on the cytosine comment, I called it, there was a question about nucleotide, about CDP was the correct answer, and I wrote something like uh, oh. cytosine, so I guess okay. I was incorrect, because I wrote cytosine was a nucleotide, cytosine was well, I have to talk about it, yeah, but, but I will, um, I have to back in the office on... Thank you. Yeah. Have a great weekend. You bet. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Yeah.